horoscopes, tarot card readers. That's what that demon is looking for, huh? I want to live my life. I want to live a life so that I'm never too far over in the flesh to cast out a demon. I'm never in my life, my entire life, I've never in my life seen a time when saints live in the flesh, wallow in the flesh, all day long in the flesh, all day long seeking flesh, uh, fleshly desires, fleshly pleasures. That's why we don't have any power. That's why so many sick people in our church, we living in the flesh. The Bible warns us about that and tells us to walk after the spirit. Trust me with your, with your forgiveness. Yeah, yeah. God ignored me. Wait, God will ignore you? Who told you that life is supposed to be easy? Who told you that? Who told you that you're supposed to be trauma free? Based on what? Nothing is supposed to happen to you? Who told you? that you would be the only human that doesn't have pain. Where did you get that from? Saul, before he was Paul, he's on his way to kill and put people in jail, newly converted saints. He wanted to either lock them up in jail or kill any person that believed on this new Jesus. In Acts chapter eight, verse three, it says, as for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house Inhaling men and women, dragging them out, putting them in prison. He continued that behavior until he saw a bright light that blinded him. Saul is on his way to Damascus. Everybody in his entourage. I do believe this is the time when he's going for the big one. He gathered everybody. This is the big time when he's going to get everybody. He's going to lock everybody up or kill everybody. Get them all out of the way. We're tired of hearing about this Jesus. Him and his entourage. They heard the Lord, but nobody saw him. And Saul said, who, is, who, who are you? Who are you, God? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you persecuted. When did Saul persecute Jesus? When you persecute God's people, you persecute him. That's why he said, it's hard for you to kick against the pricks. And he trembled. He was scared and he was astonished. And he said, Lord, what do you want me to do? And the Lord said to him, get up, and go into the city. Then you'll find out what I want you to do. Notice Saul was the only one that was blinded. He was the only one that was knocked off of his horse and fell to the earth. You can be going through a major issue that doesn't affect anybody but you. Why wasn't everybody else blinded? They heard it, but why wasn't everybody else blinded? Newsflash. God is not going to speak to you out of the sky like he did Saul. He won't talk to you during your carnal attempt to entertain yourself either. He uses the Bible to say what he already said. If you don't read the Bible, how can he bring those things to your remembrance? Sometimes, sometimes corporate prayers, prayers in fellowship can give you direction. Sometimes you can hear him speak through other people. That's why fellowship is important. The Bible says faith comes by hearing the word of God. And the Bible also says, how can they hear without a spiritual leader? This is the most, this part is important. Hearing from a spiritual leader. It's also the most common way for God to speak to you. For example, imagine if you didn't tell everything to your pastor. You just prayed one morning and you prayed fervently, and you go to church and the pastor preaches about the same issue, that's gotta be God. That's why it's important to pray that God uses the man of God to speak to you. That's why it's important to listen to spiritual songs. That's why it's important to take time out for God, time out for devotion, time out to read your Bible. Saul was baptized in Jesus' name, filled with the Holy Ghost. That's Saul's name was changed to Paul. The same person, all right? God worked a miracle, he restored his sight, and that's when Saul began his ministry in Christ. As soon as he began to preach Jesus, they tried to kill him. The Bible says they watched all day. They watched all night. 
to kill him. How come y'all didn't try to kill him before? Why do you want to kill him now? When you was a sinner, you had a bunch of friends, didn't you? All of your friends, all of your family loved you and they adored you when you was a sinner, when you was doing what they wanted you to do. When he was persecuting, locking uh, saints up, when he was killing God's chosen people, nobody said nothing. Have you ever noticed when you don't do what your friends want you to do? Now they're mad. Bitten by a snake, got beaten more times than he can count, in prisons more frequent, in deaths often, of his own people five different times. Paul's own people beat him with whips 39 times each, five different times. Paul said three times I got beat with rods. Once I got stoned. Three times I suffered shipwreck. A full night and a day I was stuck in the water. You wanna be anointed? I've been in many Journeys, said Paul, that was dangerous. Dangerous in the waters. I was dangerous amongst robbers. I was in danger by my own countrymen. I go to another country and you see your own people and you're in danger by your own people. In danger by the heathen. In danger in the city. In danger in the wilderness. In danger in the sea. In danger amongst liars. Paul said, I've been tired. I've been in pain. I've had insomnia, can't sleep at night. I've been in hunger. I've been in thirst. I've been in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. People don't really know your past. People don't really know your current pain, do they? Everybody has a story. Everybody has a pain and a trauma. Oftentimes, childhood trauma. I told my mother once about a childhood trauma about me. Something horrible happened. She had no idea. Told her this last year. She had no idea. She was standing right next to me when it happened. How is that possible that these people can see what Saul is going through? They not get blinded. How is it possible I can go through this trauma and my own mother standing right next to me didn't know it? You're not the only person. You're not the only one that had to deal with a bad childhood. You're not the only person that had to go through a divorce. You're not the only person that had to bury a loved one. You're not the only person that's been fired from a job you liked. You're not the only person that's been broke. You're not the only person that had to go through hard times and had your heart broken. It's a common trick of the enemy to make you think what you're dealing with is uncommon and you're by yourself. Going through all of that, there's only one thing that Paul had a major problem with. He just listed everything that he had a problem with. Forget about all that. We see Paul had a major problem that I didn't mention. He prayed, he prayed three times for God to remove a thorn that he had in his flesh. That's what he called it. None of these things happened to him though. None of the things I mentioned happened to him until he started walking with God. Why doesn't the Bible mention Paul's childhood trauma or his young adult consequences? Paul was given a thorn in his flesh. 2 Corinthians 12 verse 7 says, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh. Did you catch that? It was given to me. He says, the thorn in the flesh was the messenger of Satan to buffet me. What's a thorn? We go to Numbers 33, 55. It says, but if ye will not drive out the inhabitants of the land from before you, then it shall come to pass that those which ye let remain of them shall be pricks in your eyes and thorns in your sides. Is it talking about a literal thorn in your side? Joshua 23, 13 says, Now for certainly that the Lord your God will no more drive out any of these nations from before you, but they, will be, they shall be snares and traps unto you and scourges in your sides, and now thorns in your eyes. This is not talking about an actual thorn. Okay? Judges 2 verse 3 says, Wherefore I also said, I will not drive them out from before you, but they shall be thorns in your sides. Do you see a pattern here? Paul often uses scriptures in his letters. He's writing to people who already know the Bible. He's writing to people that knows that these script, what these scriptures mean. They understand it wasn't a literal thorn. All right. What is a messenger of God? An angel. 
If a messenger of God is an angel, what is a messenger of Satan? Paul said, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to buffet me. What does buffet mean? It means a blow from the fist, a strike with the fist, to hit hard with knuckles. That's what it literally means. Is it possible that a demon followed him around and physically attacked him? Doesn't matter, because either way, God is a healer. But he didn't heal Paul. God is a deliverer, but he didn't deliver Paul. God is a way maker, but he didn't make a way for Paul. Why not? He's doing everything he's supposed to do. He's not living in sin. He's doing everything he's supposed to do. There was a time when Paul had an encounter with a demon, a fortune teller, tarot card reader, horoscope reader, palm reader. Acts 16, 16 says, And it came to pass, as we went to prayer, a young girl possessed with a spirit of fortune telling, met us. She made her masters lots of money. I'm not sure if she was a slave and they just, they found out that she was demon possessed and they used her to fortune tell and make a lot of money by her prophesying. This demon possessed girl, she followed Paul and the rest of his disciples and screamed saying, these men are the servants of the most high God which show us the way of salvation. Live your life so that the devil knows exactly who you are. Have you ticked him off yet? When your feet hit the ground in the morning, every demon ought to tremble. What are you doing to get on the devil's radar? How many worshipers have you brought him? Does all of your friends, does all of your family members know there's something different about you? They have to say it. Other people have to say you are a servant of the most high God, just like this demon. Because if you testify of yourself, you're a liar, according to the Bible. That's why Jesus couldn't say he's God. He had to do the work of God, and then you had to testify that he's God. If the devil says you're a child of God, that's when you got it right. If a demon is following around you and, selling, and saying and screaming and telling people you are a servant of the most high God, you got it right. The Bible says she did this for many days. But then Paul got annoyed. He got irritated. He turned and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out the same hour. So I got some questions for you. Did you notice the girl didn't lie? The demon didn't lie. The spirit didn't lie. Why would she be chasing after them and yelling the truth? That's question number one. Question number two, why did Paul wait many days? Why did he suffer this girl to have a demon inside of her? And notice, Paul only spoke to the spirit. He didn't say anything to the girl. He spoke to the spirit. Imagine if we all got delivered from people and started dealing with the spirit controlling the people. Imagine if we stopped fighting flesh and blood and dealt with the spirit. You'll find out we got a common enemy. My last question is, where did the spirit go that he cast out? That spirit went somewhere and looked for a body. If you're not living holy, if you're playing around with the things that she is capable of doing, prophecy, horoscopes, tarot card readers, that's where that demon is looking for a home. I want to live my life. I want to live a life so that I'm never too far over in the flesh to cast out a demon. I've never in my life, my entire life, I've never in my life seen a time when saints live in the flesh, wallow in the flesh, all day long in the flesh, all day long seeking flesh, uh, fleshly desires, fleshly pleasures. That's why we don't have any power. That's why so many sick people in our church, we living in the flesh. The Bible warns us about that and tells us to walk after the spirit. Paul going through all of what he went through, went through all of that. But there's still one thing that but Paul had a major problem with. 2 Corinthians 12, 8, it says, For this thing, I went to God three times so he can take it away from me. He prayed three times for God to remove a thorn that he had in his flesh that it sounded like God gave him. God gave it to him. I know what it's like to have a major problem. 
I know what it's like to have a problem that only God can fix. If God gave him this problem, who can you run to? The devil isn't a problem because you can always go to God. You can always go to the saints. You can always go to your spiritual leader. But when God, he prayed three times, what do you think his first prayer was like? What do you think the first prayer out of the three, what do you think that was like? Somebody said, prayer avail it much. Wrong. It's a different kind of prayer. James 5, 16 tells you what kind of prayer. It's the effectual, fervent prayer that avail it much. If you don't have a normal devotion time, when you need God, God's going to say, oh, now you call me. Now you want something. Where were you yesterday? Where were you last month when I needed you to witness to somebody? When you woke up this morning, did you reach for me? What did you reach for first? Go pray to that. God healed Paul when he was blind. So that's proof that God is still a healer. God is a deliverer, but he didn't deliver Paul. God is a way maker, but he didn't make a way. God is a healer, and we worship him for being a healer, but he didn't send a healing virtue. God is a prayer answering God, but God ignored him. Why didn't he answer you? When you pray, why are your prayers unanswered? Now answer this. Do you really want him to answer? What if you don't like his answer? Sometimes when you're praying, you ain't praying hard enough. Sometimes you got to push the plate back. Prayer has to be something you enter in and stay in all day. Real prayer has no amen. Real prayer, you say, I'll be back. Sometimes when you pray, you got to get down on your belly. Sometimes when you pray, you got to be purposeful. You got to go a little bit further. You got to fight your flesh. You got to destroy the desires of your flesh. And you got to get yourself into the throne room of God. You got to put all of this stuff away. You got to turn the phone off. Only a true worshiper can accept the sovereignty of God. God will do whatever you want when he wants, if he wants. It's cool to be God, do what I wanna do, if I feel like doing it. Isaiah 46, 10 says, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, the things that are not done yet. God said, my pleasure, I'm sorry, my counsel shall stand. God said, I will do all my pleasure. That means I'll do what I feel like it. Paul prayed three times. What do you think his first prayer was like? His first prayer, God ignored him. How embarrassing. How embarrassing is it for your friends to discover your God that you've been talking about didn't answer you? They see the problem. They know the issues that you got. They know you're praying. You told them you're praying. You asked them to pray with you. You went to your prayer partner and you still got the same problem. How embarrassing is that? Second prayer, God didn't say nothing. You prayed and you cried. You cried and you prayed. And the problem that you had is still the problem that you have. How can you tell anyone to serve your God? What do you mean you have a sickness? What do you mean you're sick? I thought you were saved. Third prayer, God snapped on him. He said, my grace is sufficient. How would you like to be snapped on by God? What if God says no? What if what you're asking him for, the answer is no? What if what you're asking him for, you don't like his answer? What if you don't like the way he talks to you? God will do all of his pleasure and there's nothing you can do about it. What if grace is all you're gonna get? Do you still wanna be saved? Do you still wanna be a worshiper? God told Paul, my grace is enough for you. For my strength is made perfect when I make you weak. When you're weak, I'm strong. It's not even about you. Got nothing to do with you. God created evil. And inside of evil is pain. When God created evil, he created discomfort. He created trauma. He created heartache. 
He created disappointment. He created this when he created evil. And he knows all about it. God is sovereign. What are you going to do about it? When God said no to Paul, you'll never see in the Bible where Paul brought it up ever again. Done with it. That's a true worshiper. Because he, he respects and he understands. He got it. God is in control. Y'all remember David? David prayed for his son to be delivered. His son was sick. His son was dying. And David prayed. I don't remember how many days, but David prayed just like the Bible says. The Bible says pray without ceasing. The Bible says pray without and, and don't stop. And that's what he did. But once his son died, you know, when God said no, David washed his face, moved on. It's time for you to wash your face. You can keep on praying, God can keep on ignoring you. This don't mean do, don't this doesn't mean that you, you're not supposed to go do whatever you need to do to fix your problem, whatever you have to do within your realm of possibility. But there's gotta be a point when you realize God knows. There's gotta be a point when you realize God cares and God is in control, and it's time to move on. It's time to wash my face. It's time to accept this. Don't think God doesn't have a plan. If he saved you, he wants you. He wants you. God wants you. You're looking at all the fallen pieces while God is looking at the expected end. That's Jeremiah 29, 11. You're looking at the homework and the pop quiz and I'm looking at the diploma. I see you walking across the stage. God don't care about the broken pieces. He doesn't care about the process. He's looking at the expected end. He cares about getting that pride out of you. Paul figured out God's got a plan and God's plan is not man's plan and God knows better than me. He figured something out without God even saying it. He figured it out. God knows what's best for me. That's all you need to figure out. Once you get that, anxiety leaves. Once you know that God is with you and God got you, once you know that God hears your prayers, peace, a calm comes over you. Stop listening to these preachers that's telling you you're coming out. Stop listening to these preachers that's telling you 10 steps to a turnaround. I'm telling you, you're going to just have to live with it. This is your trauma with your name on it, but it's okay because God knows all about it. That's the difference in the power you have. You can deal with it and still worship God. That's what makes you great. That's what makes you special. That's why God loves you, because you're the only one that can go through what you went through and don't even look like it. Look in the mirror. You look good. You look strong. You, you look like victory. You might have went through a fire, but I can't even tell. There's no smoke on you. I'm so glad I have a God that's a man and he knows my pain. I'm glad I, knows a, I have a God that knows my sorrow. He knows my disappointment. He knows desperation because he's been through it. He knows despair. He knows loneliness. I'm so glad that God hears my pain. He hears it. When you pray, he hears it. I'm glad God hears my agony, my heartache, my confusion. He knows about my betrayal. I'm so glad God knows me. The Bible says God cares deeply about the birds that fly in the air. He said, if I care about the bird and you're more valuable than that. God said, I know the hairs. I know how many hairs you have on your head. When you went to bed and cried all night, I counted them. When you're sleeping, this is the kind of God we serve. Do you think God doesn't know where his spirit is? Do you, you really think God wants to look stupid, saving you only out of all your family, out of all your friends, out of all your coworkers, just to lose you to the devil? Here's your prescription, 2 Corinthians 13, 5. The Bible says, here's the prescription. You got to follow all of it, every step. Examine yourself. Check yourself. Check yourself and see whether you be in the faith. Prove to yourself, know it for yourself, that you have the Holy Ghost. If you don't have him, get him. God is coming back for you. 
He's coming back for you and he can't wait. If you've been filled with the Holy Ghost, that's your plane ticket. If you don't have the Holy Ghost, why not get him today? Then you can be confident of this very thing, that he which has begun a good work in you will perform it until the Lord comes back. No one is going to tell you that you're saved. Do you have a desire to obey every word in this book? Have you repented and turned away from every sin in your life? How are you going to prove to yourself that you, that you still feel with the Holy Ghost? Have you heard yourself speaking tongues? And you know you had zero control over that. The Bible says, as the Spirit gives utterance. I wasn't you. If not, why not? Why not repent today? Aren't you sorry for the sins that you committed? Don't you want to go back with God when he returns? Don't you want to have a connection with him? When the Holy Ghost shows up, when you fully repented, when you're done with this lifestyle and you want the life that God has for you, when you fully turn away from your sins and the weights, when you turn for that, the Holy Ghost will show up and he'll start talking. He'll let everybody know, I've taken residence in this body. Are you 100% sure that Jesus is currently inside of you? I'm so glad for God's grace. I'm so glad for God's grace. Thank y'all for coming. What if that's all you're gonna get? Is that enough? Is it good enough that God will let you slide with all the stuff that you've done, all the secret sins that you think nobody knows about? God recorded it and he's gonna, is it good enough that he'll let you slide? Is his grace good enough? I'm so glad I woke up with a chance to get it right. I'm so glad I woke up with another chance to get it together. I'm so glad God saved me and didn't tell nobody what I did. Can you imagine if salvation required public confession? Can you imagine if in order for you to be saved, you had to come down front of the church and explain and go through everything that you ever did in front of everybody? God says, don't even worry about it. I'm gonna take everything that you did. I got a C, it's called forgetfulness. And I'm gonna take everything you did and for your sake, I'm gonna put it in there. I don't remember it no more. You didn't do anything. That's grace. If God gives you that, that's all you need. You can go through some hard times because you're getting away with a lot of stuff. If you're truly saved, what else matters? I'm so glad I got God on my side. I'm so glad God said no sometimes because at least he answered. I'm glad he heard me. That's why you gotta pray more often and pray and pray and pray and pray till God hears you. God ignored me, but at least he heard me. Is that all right? Are you happy that God at least heard you? There will never be a time in my life where I'll be comfortable not having certainty that God hears me. That will, I will never be comfortable with that. How can you sit there peaceful and not know if God hears you? I already know that if I keep sin in my heart, God won't hear me. So the best thing for me to do is not keep sin in my heart. I know in order for God to hear me, I gotta live right. My heart gotta be right. My soul gotta be ready. My goals gotta be pure. I will never allow sin to block communication to my God as if I don't need him. As if when calamity comes, I can figure it out on my own. I need you, Jesus. I need you, God. I can't allow sin to destroy my life. I can't allow sin to give my flesh what it wants because my flesh wants what it wants right now because my flesh doesn't have an eternal resting place. So I'm glad that God won't answer sometimes as long as he hears me. So if he don't answer, I'll never let it be because of me. If he don't answer, I know it's because it's what's best for me. If I pray and God doesn't answer, if I pray three times, if I pray 20 times and he doesn't answer and he doesn't fix it, he doesn't change it, I know it's what's best for me. Because if he doesn't answer, I know at least he heard me. I do want God to hear me. And I don't care about him hearing my voice. I want him to hear my soul. I want him to hear my blood talk to him. Do you want God to hear you? Do you want God to hear you? Do you want God to hear you? You gotta move sin out of your life. All of it. You gotta accept that you gotta that you want everything that God wants for you. God wants you to be well. God wants you to live holy. 
God wants to take you home with him when he comes back. God ignored me, but at least he heard me. Thank you, Jesus. God ignored me, but at least he answered. God ignored me, but thank you, Jesus. I'm so glad that I'm not getting what I want. God ignored me, but at least he answered me. Thank you, Jesus. Yeah.